there we go. Glory to God. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It is uh, it is good to be in the house together. For sure, for sure. Whether we won that $1.3 billion or not. Although, how fun would that be? Some dude in New Jersey. Yep. I still, when, when, when I'm... When I think about these guys winning that, but my first thought is, I wonder if he's got a church home. I wonder if he's been a faithful tither, tither and I wonder how excited his pastor might be. <laughs> you know, a bunch of pastors there in whatever city in New Jersey that was are all wondering, was that one of ours? You'll know immediately, sir. <laughs> Glory to God. Man, oh man. Well, Easter weekend coming up. You think about the the journey that uh, Jesus began on Palm Sunday, and it just gets, I think it gets, it gets heavier, but it gets sweeter. I think he would, he would have us not focus so much on what happened to him as much as he would on what he did for us. Well, we're going to receive the Lord's tithe and your offering. And I was going through my notes, and this is a quote from Pastor Ken that still to this day, it's like, oh man, that is so good. He said, want to is not a signal to do. How many, gosh, how many times I've I got a barn full of want to. Well, I had a barn full of want to. It's not as full, but there's a whole lot of stuff in there that just seems so important in the moment. And it's just not. That's a that's a good thing for us to remember. Actually, for this evening, I just kind of wanted to give you a, a scripture by scripture. Let's run through tithing real quick. Matthew 23, 23. This is so good to me when people talk about uh, tithing's not mentioned. There's no mention of tithing in the in the New Testament. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law: justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. So obviously, there's something important in the New Testament about sowing and reaping. Galatians 6, 7 says, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. You're not going to fool him. You might think you're doing... <laughs> How funny is it that we think we do something and it's like, well, nobody's going to know. Hey, there was a season when, and this has been a long time ago, we'd get the time to write out that tithe check and it'd be like, well, you know, she'll, she'll never know. He knew. He reminded me of that pretty quick. Luke 6.38 says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Not a measure of, well, here's just enough. It's a good measure. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. In 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each of us should give what we have decided in our heart to give. Not reluctantly, not under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So don't let anybody ever shame you into giving. Don't let anybody ever shame you into, into tithing. But if you'll pursue it in the word, you'll develop a heart for it. And once you start it, I can assure you it's a, it's a bit of a snowball effect. You get to where you really look forward to tithing, to sowing, to, to giving into other people's lives. And let's always remember, um, the tithe is the the first fruit of your increase. That's your, your paycheck. That's your income tax return. That's a lot of different things, but it's not just money. But 
you tie yes pastor you tie there's so many facets in your life your time your prayer time words of encouragement just a a hug you can sow those things and when you start start thinking about how much time there is in a day just look at an hour and think well what if i were to purpose myself to give six minutes of every hour that i'm awake to the lord can you imagine what you could do with that much prayer time word time just communion praying in the spirit can you imagine what you would move in a heavenly realm there's lots of there's lots more uh, besides money and I like the way pastor put it we tithe our life we tithe throughout the the entirety of what we do absolutely well when it when it all you know when we're talking about the tithe we are usually talking specifically about money but when you understand that it's all his not just the money all of it when you release yourself to that then yeah your your whole life the first thing you want to do is serve him and give back to him and honor him and worship him and glory to God I think we've got a We've got a pretty strong tithers group here at Heartland Church. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you that this is the day that you've made. We rejoice. We're glad in it. Lord, I thank you that, Lord, you've gone before us and prepared our way. And you know the plans that you have for us. They're they're always for good, never for evil. We thank you, Father, that we honor you. We worship you with the find the first of our increase in of our lives. Lord, that we are not we don't we don't look to sow just enough. Because you've never provided just enough into our lives. We walk in the exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think and we're grateful for it. And we're thankful that we reap what we sow that your word is true. I thank you, Father, that it returns to us, pressed pressed down, shaken together, and running over. We are a blessed people. We are a blessed body. We live in a blessed country, in a blessed state, in a blessed county, in a blessed city. And we thank you for that. We honor you and we praise you for what we have here. We don't take it for granted. And Lord, I thank you that We are not familiar. We're honorable. We approach you in honor and integrity. And we love you and we worship you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, early Sunday morning, we're going to be uh, starting the day with a sunrise service. We've been uh, invited to co-host that sunrise service at the Texas 4-H Center and uh, I just I just hope as many of us can, as as can will be there uh, in support of the fact that Heartland Church is the co-host of the event and I think it's pretty important that we show up so if you can starts at seven o'clock and uh, man what a what a great way to begin Resurrection Sunday sunrise over the lake hmm Don't know why that chokes me up, but it does. Um, they've got a new uh, amphitheater out there that uh, is, from what I understand, beautiful. So I look forward to getting my sh- first shot at seeing that. And then uh, Sunday, March 31st, of course, uh, our Resurrection Sunday Easter celebration. So it's going to be, as Easter Sundays usually are, pretty packed. And I'm thankful for that. So put on your extra heavy duty loving on new faces uh faces that maybe you haven't seen in a while and let's just hug them up and love on them like we do so very well if you would please stand and honor our our pastor jason stutter thank you everybody so much thank you everybody i feel the same way about all of you father we're so thankful for another divine privilege to come together under one roof and 
feast on the table of the Lord, fellowship with believers, people that are for each other, all pursuing one God, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one immersion. Father, we want to know you. We want to know the Lord Jesus. We want more intimacy with the Spirit of God. Teach us tonight, Lord. We ask you please to do that. It's a joy and a, such a great, great hope and assurance to know that we are born again by the witness of the Spirit, the presence of God on the deep inside of us. That we've been raised from the dead. When you came out of death, we were able to come into the presence of God. When the veil rent, right then began, let us come boldly to the throne that we may obtain grace. The end of the age of animal sacrifice because the Lamb of God, the man, the God-man, the incarnate Christ laid on an altar called the cross, the mercy seat of God at Calvary's hill, the place of the skull and took in that death and that resurrection, that ascension and seating, took the authority of death eternally from him who had it that being the devil. Now you hold all power and the authority of death, hell, and the grave. And Father, it is with humbleness, but with great confident assurance based on your word and the witness of the wedding ring that lives in the inside of us that we've been raised from the dead and eternal death has no taste bud for me because he tasted death for the whole world and I believe it and I've entered into it by faith in you. So Father help us tonight leave with something we didn't have when we came or at least knowledge of it in Jesus' name, our high priest, savior and deliverer, mediator and go-between, amen. Praise the Lord. Please smile at somebody as you're sitting down. Thank you for being here, Gabriel. Isn't it a joy? All right, all right. Oh, thank you, Lord. It's good to be here. Thank you for being here tonight. How many of you are thankful that you're saved and you know you're saved? Yes, Man. Hey. <laughs> Most important question in the whole Bible. Acts 16. The head guard of the, the wing that they had Paul and Silas in. They praised and they pray and praised God until, I mean, a move of the Spirit came. It says an earthquake. That's what it appeared as. But an earthquake doesn't open all the cell doors and take all the cuffs off everybody's hands. Uh, and under Roman guard, if, if your captives got away, it's your life. And that man was fixing to kill himself, and Paul said, don't kill yourself. He said, we're all here. Most important question in the whole Bible, that man said, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said these words, 
Believe on the Lordship of Jesus Christ and you shall be saved and your household. There ain't enough said about household salvations. And that's just Bible. Noah was the only person found righteous on earth. Only one. Didn't say, didn't say nothing about Shem, Ham, and Japheth pleasing the Lord. And he said, no, I have found you righteous in my sight. Take you, your wife, and your, and your sons and enter into the ark. And your Bible says they entered the ark with Noah. When you see the word with there, it's important. With The whole book of Genesis revolves around Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Joseph. The whole book. And it goes from all of creation, goes to the pers person that God made covenant with, a blood covenant, being Abraham, where the whole picture and type is played of Abraham and Isaac being the father in Jesus and there the lamb was slain, blood was spilled and the flaming torch and the passing each other, walking through blood, there's, there's the picture of the father and the son at, in the land of Moriah, which is where Calvary is. And the last person that hinges around is Joseph who is the picture of our deliverer who was sold into the pit, went deeper into the pit he was not revealed to his brothers. There's Joseph and the Jewish people. He sent everybody out of the room and, and, and there's all the Gentiles dealt with and gone now. And he took his makeup off and revealed himself to his children. There's a, when once there's, there's uh, the Jewish people's eyes open through spiritual revelation. So the whole book, um, you know, when you were saying something, Brother Bob, made me think, when we, when we, I just kept thinking, you tithe your life. If you, if, you have, if you literally tithe your life, you live every minute of the day of, should I eat this or should I not, Lord? Should I drink this or should I not, Lord? Should I go here or should I not, Lord? You want me to bless them with that? Okay. You don't want me to, okay, I, I was going to, okay. You want me to wear that today? I don't have to know why, but okay, I'll wear that today. Okay, I'm going here, I was gonna wear this, but I feel a check. You know why the check is, I don't have to know, you know why. You know who's gonna be there. There's certain places I won't wear a short sleeve shirt because I know somebody, people would stumble over my tattoos, so I don't do it. I don't expect them, you know, will be bigger than that. No, they're not. <laughs> And so, uh, you tithe your life. Isn't it interesting, he didn't say the first command, most important command is you shall love God with all your money. He said love God with all your heart and you will with your money. You love God with all your heart, you'll love him with everything. You'll love him with everything. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then the, the second was as great as the first one, love your neighbor as yourself. That changed under the new covenant, not just love your neighbor as yourself. It went to love your neighbor as much as I love you. There's the new of an old commandment. That's what Jesus meant when he said a new commandment I give you, that you love each other as I have loved you. That's something nobody had ever done and nobody was empowered to do until they had the spirit of God. You can't love each other. We can't love each other the way God loves us just out of human love. Amen. Impossible. So let's say a few things tonight about why the resurrection part one, question mark, part one. Why the resurrection? To understand raised from the dead, I believe we're talking to word people here tonight, all right? If you're not, just play like you are. You'll be one before you leave, I promise. We get to know the Lord through his word, saints. Thank God for experiences, but if you've never had one that you feel like you can really share, if you, you get, learn him from his word. 
Get to know the Lord from his word. Some people have had extraordinary experiences. I've had a few. And, um, but listen, that didn't make me spiritual. Uh, I had a wonderful experience. I've had lots of divine, wow experiences. But it's his word is how faith comes. Faith doesn't come from an experience. Faith comes from the word. It comes from hearing. It comes from him speaking and you hearing. And so get to know the Lord from his word. He's exalted his word above his name. Uh, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will be forever. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. Okay? He upholds all things by the word of his power. Through the word, all things were made. So get to know the Lord through his word. Let him speak to you from and through his word. Spend time with the word. You want to get God involved in something, get his word involved in it. Okay? So, to understand raised from the dead. Say that phrase with me. Raised from the dead. Then we have to understand, first of all, what is death? Now, this is a long uh, talk, if you will, but we're not going to have time to get through, you know. This is something that, it takes a lot of time to really hash this out, but let's pull Romans 5.12 in the King James, please. Let's start there, Romans 5.12. To understand raised from the dead, we have to have some understanding of what is death, and thank you for coming tonight. Therefore, just as through one man, that's Adam, Sin, that's not deeds, verbs, that's down nature. Sin entered the system. And death, that is spiritual death, not physical death. Death came through the nature of sin that is in the man. And so spiritual death spread to all men because all sinned. How can all sin because every, all humanity is in his loins when he committed the high treason? Make sense? All right. The Barley Bible says a sentence rests upon all men for all inherited the effects of Adam's disobedience. I want you to think of this, you can just write down John 1, 4. In him was life, and the life was the light. The inward spiritual illumination. In him was life, but we're in classroom, this is so fun. In him was life, that spiritual life. And that spiritual life is the illumination, the light of mankind. All right, your Bible says in Proverbs 20, 27, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. So if my spirit is the lamp of God and in him was life and that life was my candle, when death and sin nature entered in, mankind's candle, it's, he's, full of, he's filled with darkness. There's no light. He's walking in the dark from within. So he needs, there's, there's no life literally coming from within. Everything is external and, it, and nothing is lasting. That's why the high priests, you know, they, 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 the Joe Blow from, from the tribe of Levi is the high priest. Okay, well, someday Joe Blow's gonna die. What are you gonna do now? So another one is inaugurated. Another one is inaugurated. Another, what? That's it, it's, it, nothing would sustain. So man's inward candle was literally put out, blowed out by the nature of sin itself And the death being the result or the final payoff 
of sin's nature. Does that make sense to anybody? All right. The Bible is focused primarily around two things, life and death. Spiritual life and spiritual death. It's focused primarily around two people, the first Adam and the last Adam, Jesus. Now listen to me, let's, 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 let's have school here. This is so wonderful. Sin was in the system before, so crucial how you word this, the law of the covenant was given. These are already covenant people. The law's not the covenant. Don't ever forget it. Don't ever forget that. The law's not the covenant. These are already covenant people because they come out of Abraham's loins. Amen. Don't ever forget that. The law is not the covenant. It's, it, was, it, was, it was an external schoolmaster to hem them and lead them and guide them to show them it was a long, 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 brutal hallway pointing them to Christ. And it had an expiration date on it called It Is Finished. Are you with me? But the law is not, never was, it's not the covenant. The people are covenant people because they came out of Abraham. All right. It's interesting, your Bible says sin, that nature was in the world. Before the law was given. Okay. If you, if you do a good study, this is real interesting. From about Leviticus 14, 15, 16, somewhere in there, that's where, first of all, blood offerings are instituted and the high priest ministry is instituted. Before anyone was held accountable, See, God knows they can't do it. So before we inaugurate this thing, we've got to have, I've got to tell them, tell the high priest and the priest, these are the animals you can use for sacrifice. Why? Because we've got to have shedding of blood. Why? Because they can't keep the law. I know that, but they think they can. And we've got to have a high priest ministry because they can't come directly to me because of sin and death. There has to be a mediator, an intercessor, a go-between that they come through. That's why your Bible says, even though sin was in the world before the law was given, there was not, sin was not judged like it, uh, because where there is no law, there is no sin. All right, are you following me? There's a lot of principles, there's a lot of truths, there's a lot of learning we can do but primarily, church, listen, primarily, from the law given all the way through, all the way through Joshua, Judges, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Ruth, Nehemiah, all these books. You get into major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, blah, blah, blah. You get into the minor prophets. You get into this, a lot of end time stuff, and Zephaniah, Zechariah. Then you have this, this one page that says New Testament. Between there, there's hundreds of years of the dark ages, and that's where the Pharisees come about. It was, it was reformed men that wanted to, to, to keep the holiness of God, but God did not speak for hundreds of years, and so man is left to his own self of how to get right with God, and so man's ideas got into it. And so that's where you get into, you, you, you make the traditions of, you make the word of God of no effect through your own handed down oral traditions. Then you get into this book, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All right, all the way from where I talked about, way back to about Matthew 12, 45. It's primarily 
to the Jews. We can learn principles. I love the, you can't appreciate the new if you don't have some understanding of the old. And it's primarily to the Jewish people. You have to be very careful as a, a Gentile now Christian, new, new creation, that you don't let anybody and don't let your own lack of understanding plug you in somewhere that it ain't for you. Now, First Corinthians 15, 21 says, by man came spiritual death and by man also came the resurrection of the dead. When we, think, when we say raised from the dead, make yourself go deeper than a rock tomb and a stone rolled away. Because that tomb would still be closed up and bloody napkins laying there if he wasn't first of all made alive spiritually. Adam died twice. Jesus died twice. Jesus was raised in two forms. God said, Adam, the moment you eat from that tree dying, you will die. He died that moment. 930 years later, he died physically. Spiritual death is what enabled physical death. Jesus on the cross, he said, my God, you have left me. What just happened? He who knew no sin became sin. He died spiritually. That enabled him to give up the ghost and he died physically. He went to hell, the deepest parts of hell. He was raised spiritually and that's what enabled him to be raised physically. You've been raised spiritually in the, in, in the, in the, the, the born again experience. There'll be a day you're gonna be raised. You've already, listen, the believer's already been raised from the dead spiritually. If you go by natural causes or however before the coming of the Lord, there's a day, listen to me. First of all, remember this. All humans are gonna be raised from the dead. Not just the believer. There's two resurrections. One of life and one of everlasting judgment and condemnation. The believer to be absent from his body is to be present with the Lord. The believer sleeps. Soul sleep. The unbeliever is called dead, spiritual death. And they go to a place literally that is alive and thriving right now, sad to say, called hell or shoal. It's a place, it's one of like seven holding places within the earth. It's absolutely absent of love, life, light, peace, joy, and anything of happiness. And it's the place that the departed spirits of the unrighteous dead go when they leave their body physically. Now please listen to me. There's nowhere in scripture that it teaches that once a person has died and departed, left, and went to hell, and me and you don't know, don't ever try to figure out who did and who didn't. You, we don't know. You don't know that person's spirit, only God does. But once that person has entered hell, there's no teaching in the Bible that says that some angel or somebody gets to come and preach the gospel and hopefully they believe and get another chance at redemption. It's, it's over. The door's closed, it's eternal. Now the good thing is on this side of it, there's nothing that says once I'm born again and I've got the witness of the spirit that outside 
of divorcing the Lordship of Jesus Christ from true belief in my heart that I do not believe he is the Son of God. I do not believe that in blood sacrifice and that his blood redeemed. I do not believe it. Th these words in your Bible, forsake, depart from, refuse him. That has so been used to keep Christians scared and we are not to live scared. Those words are in context to the apostate. Yes, sir. Not the believer that trips up. Not even to the believer that gets in. That's, that's far different from even from what your word calls error. Yes, sir. Far different. For the believer, Paul said, I'm convinced that there's nothing in this life or in the life to come not life or death, principality, power, devils or angels, sickness, disease or death that can separate that death, spiritual death is the word thanatos and it means I-E period to separate. Paul said there's nothing that can separate me from the Greek word ek out of the love of God. Seven times in John 17, Jesus is praying and he makes it clear seven times that the Father is the one that has put the believer into Jesus' hands and Jesus has put them back into the Father's hands. And that's why earlier he said, and no man can pluck you out of my Father's hand. Isn't that wonderful? But those scriptures have, have been taken out of context, not rightly divided when it says, see you fallen from grace. You need to, I mean, you need to write this in your Bible at some point. The entire book of Hebrews, Hebrews, first of all, let's start with the title. Hebrews, what do you mean? Messianic Jews. What's that? That's Jewish people that have been under Judaism, devout Judaism. I'm talking Torah toting people devout Judaism, living under and, and, and whipped with the law. They had come into the message of faith. They had come all the way into Christ. But because of this adventure, and Hebrews 10 will tell you, remember the day when you were the laughing stock and you took it with pride and you endured your homes being plundered and your, your fields being burned and they were mocking, what are you saying? They, they were getting this persecution from this faith in Christ. And so they weren't fully committing because of the level of persecution and so they started drawing back and that's why, and people have used this to put condemnation on people. We're not of them that draw back, Brother Bob. Finish the scripture. Unto perdition. Yeah. Unto eternal judgment. Are you with me here? They were drawing back because of fear of the persecution. This wasn't just, <laughs> oh man, I, I joined Christ and they unfriended me. I'm not talking about that stupid stuff. I'm talking about your home being burnt to the ground. Everything you own is, it's ash. The next day, your, your car is, it's gone. Your children are robbed. Why? Because you believe in Christ. You're following Christ. And so they were like, Ugh. and so they were drawing back from the threshold of full commitment to Christ. And Paul said, man, he said, we're not of those that draw back unto judgment. Why judgment? Because they had come to the knowledge of, listen, it's Jesus and the only other thing is judgment. That's the context. It's Jesus or it's eternal judgment. If, if, you, if you fall from, sidestep, step out of him in conviction, deceptive choice of, I don't believe in this. That's the only thing he said in your Bible that insults the spirit of grace why? Because he's the, he's the engagement ring between you and Jesus. And so when I divorce, though deceived, consciously, it's not up here. You come to a deception of, I believe this. I don't believe that. I don't know why I ever believed that. 
full consciousness, you divorce Jesus, the groom. Listen to me. You insult the friend of the bridegroom, the engagement ring, the seal of God that seals you unto the day of redemption. Are we making sense? So that's where these scriptures get taken out of context of you've, you've fallen from grace. Let me tell you something. The only way you can fall out of grace is divorce Jesus. <laughs> and you ain't done that. I've had people say, I'm so afraid that I've committed the unpardonable sin. I said, tell me what it is. They said, I don't know. I said, you ain't committed it. If you want to know the unpardonable sin, what's the only sin that can't be pardoned? By rejecting, divorcing the pardon. There is no pardon if I spit on the pardon itself. There's no pardon. Everything else, saints, listen, ain't, it don't touch the blood. But these things, will, they, they get taken out of context. It's written to the Hebrew Messianic Jews who were coming into Christ but not fully committing and they were drawing back because of the level of the persecution. So, right along with that, by man came death. Let me ask you this question. If all humanity is dead spiritually, think about this. How are you gonna redeem the spirit of man? Let's think about this. It's a huge subject. How do you redeem the eternal part of mankind? Can't be a man, 100% man, why? Because they're all fallen. Well, how? Because they're all in Adam. But the Bible says Adam was a picture of Christ to come. One affects all. By one man's failure, all were made sinners. By one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Who's the many? All that receive. Amen. So how, how does divinity redeem fallen man, spirit, soul, and body? And how does he do it legally? You say, well, God's God. I mean, he could just sweep, loose. He could sweep Satan under the rug. He could, but that's how integrous and honest God is. He's got to do it legally. It has to hold up in court. It's a humongous subject. So God, he starts looking for a man that knows him that will love God, that will teach his children, that will preserve the knowledge of God in their lineage and guard that and keep God involved, even though it's fallen man. So blood offerings are presented all the time. Trespass offerings, sin offering. I mean lots of offerings. And all they do is atone, which is the word cover. Nothing could remove sin. God finds a man named Noah. The earth had become so nasty and corrupt that Noah's the only one left. And your Bible says, as in the days of Noah, so shall the coming of the Son of Man. I mean, we're really headed there. Anyway, God finds a man named Noah. He has three children, Shem, Ham, Japheth. It goes from Noah to Shem. Ham's extremely unclean, full of unclean actions. He has children, and it's, you can study his lineage. It's pathetic. But, so it goes from Noah to Shem. Through Shem, you find a man named Abraham, ghost Abraham. God makes a blood covenant with him, rainbow covenant, and I will no longer destroy the entire earth. People say, well, I've seen floods, not that destroyed the entire earth. And that's what the promise was. So it goes from, it goes from Noah to Shem, to Abraham. It goes from him. Abraham tries to produce one named Ishmael. God said, no, it won't be Ishmael. It goes to Isaac. Isaac, through, through one wife, he has two children, Esau and Jacob. 
Esau's really the firstborn. Firstborn rights go to him. God said, no, the elder will serve the younger. It goes to Jacob. See, that's why, yes, he talked that birthright out of him, but listen, that was in the plan. It goes to Jacob. You come on down, Jacob's name is changed to Israel. He has 12 boys. It goes to Judah. Are you following me? Whole time, God is, I mean, he is working with man. Stay, stay before me. Why? Because if we botch this up, how does the incarnate Christ come? And Satan's working real hard to corrupt the lineage all the time. Judah lays with Tamar, his daughter-in-law. They have children. Lot's, he, Lot ain't in it, but he's, kin, he's kinfolk with Abraham. It's his nephew. Lot, for position, says, I'll live down here in Sodom and Gomorrah. He don't know how corrupt it is. But your Bible says when they went in, he's sitting at the gate. That is a, a Jewish custom way of saying this man's big time high in political authority in the town. And at the expense of his ascension of that political ladder, his daughters both laid with him in a cave in the dark and both of them were pregnant by their daddy. Your Bible says that. And, and gave birth to the two kids that became the two most prominent enemies of Israel. All right, so it goes to Judah. God guarding and, and covering, 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 covering. Isn't that wonderful? You go on down, you get to a man named Boaz. You go to him, you get to a man named Obed. You get to a man named Jesse. You get to a man named King David. Son of David. And through him will come and this is so huge, boy, we don't have time to wear this out, but your Bible discusses the genealogy of Jesus and it says, and Joseph, the husband of Mary, he separate, see, it's the sins of the fathers that are passed down yes, in that day. Yes, so it comes all the way down to Joseph and it says, who is the <clears throat> husband of Mary? She's in the lineage. Yes. Amen. Now we have a pure in type without sin because it's the sins of the fathers that God can speak a word and she can believe it and we have that lineage and, and the incarnation can come through her. Praise the Lord. I mean, he's bearing witness. I don't know what we just rattled off the wall in there, but it's, but it's down. Man, almost said man down. No men are down in here. Are you seeing, and this is, this is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of God. Think of the patience of God, saints. Hundreds of years between Noah. Just look how many years are between Noah. Well, in, the, in Matthew, I believe it says there's 14 generations from one to this one, 14 between this one and this one, and 14 generations from this one to this one. And God working. Boy, that's how he knows every intricate detail of where we're at right now. Nothing you're gonna get into is gonna make him go, man, give me a minute to think about this. No, no. So you can see, let me tell you something, saints. Man's greatest, greatest greatest need after the fall was righteousness. What do I mean righteousness? Listen, there's positional righteousness and there's application righteousness. But you don't need to, uh, if you don't understand positional righteousness, you're gonna get into dead works in application righteousness, trying to earn positional righteousness that you can't. The veil itself screams Galatians 3, by the works of the flesh, 
By the works of the law shall no flesh be pleasing to God. Didn't matter how much blood they offered. I don't care if it's the Pharisee of Pharisees. I don't care how good you've been, young man. You still ain't going behind that veil. But I've done every offering. Don't matter. What's, it say? What's the veil screaming? Every day, all day, once a year reminding you. It's screaming this. By the works of the law shall no flesh be pleasing to God or be justified. Same Greek word, you won't be made right. Yeah. And the Bible says, so anyway, that was the thing that man had to have was this standing again with God. Okay. Are you getting anything? So life and death, always remember, these are eternal words. Eternal words words. Saints, this is legit what we're talking about. Our justification is sealed and a court record of it in the highest heaven. I mean, yes, it's something we believe, but this ain't just something we believe. All of heaven knows this happened. There is a God resurrected, spirit filled Man seated at the right hand of God right now that is your intercessor, mediator, go-between, advocate, defense attorney, high priest, captain of your salvation and deliverer and healer and savior once and for eternity. He's there right now making intercession. What do you mean, praying? No, he's standing between me and God. What do you mean? He's standing between me Let's say it better. He's standing for me. Because I'm not, I don't, I don't have to be afraid of eternal judgment. My sins, your sins have already been judged in your identification with the sin offering. When they laid hands on that lamb and they would lean and impress upon it, that was their faith believing everything bad about me, that goat's identifying with, and everything good I'm receiving of it. Just by faith. God honored it. That was just under the goats of lambs and the blood of lambs and goats. How much more? Your Bible says, not with the blood of lambs and goats, but we were redeemed with the precious blood of Jesus. Redeemed, bought out, brought out, never to be put on the auction block again. That's what that word means. Redeemed. Jesus is the ransom. Listen, his body, this is all scripture, his body is the veil. Why? Because it was sin that separated man from God. He became sin. He's the veil. He's the lamb. He's the high priest that goes behind the veil that's his own body and puts the blood of the lamb that's him on the mercy seat that is him. Walks back out with the veil that's his body that's his broken body. Are you with me? Amen. At the end of the movie, it goes up and it says, Lamb, Jesus Christ. High priest, Jesus Christ. Mercy seat, Jesus Christ. Veil, Jesus Christ. Isn't it wonderful? Huh? Huh? It is beyond words. It's just, it's awing. The integrity. This is why it's, and we're just barely scratching it, but it's all these little hidden wisdom that God was doing. It's why 1 Corinthians 2 said, had Satan and all the principalities seen what God was doing, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. Why? Because when they crucified him, they crucified the world. He made an open show of them stripped them and paraded them through the heavenlies in the cross. Now, I want to just say something here because it just, oh, it's, so, it's always been so big to me. I want you to think of this right quick. In Leviticus 16, I believe, it says you shall take two goats. Say two goats. They would always do their best to take twins out of the same litter because they would look so much alike and, and be the same. There was reasons. But they would take twins to try to get the two goats. All right. It says, you shall, you shall kill one unto the Lord. 
And the other one that the lot falls on is going to be the scapegoat or, the, or Azazel, the scapegoat. The sins of Israel are going to be placed on its head. One of the, tw it's tw don't forget this, twins. Say twins. twins. Two goats. We're going to cast lots. The lots fall. This one is going to die, shed blood unto the Lord. This one by lot. Not its choice. By lot. It's the way the cards fell, man. It's going to be the scapegoat. All the sins of Israel are going to be placed on its head, and they're going to, they're going to take it, put a, put a, it's so huge if you read the garden thing. Guess they're going to put a rope around its neck, and they're going to lead it out of the garden. <laughs> All these things are in the garden, I guess. They lead it out by the hand of a fit man, and he jogs like this. And he gets, and it's basically like a baton. He gets out there probably half a mile, and he hands it off in another hand of a fit man. He drives another. And they hand it off, and it gets out there, and they push it off of a hill so that it cannot come back. Why? Because that goat, by faith, has the sins of Israel on it. It is called, it was cut off out of the land of the living. Isaiah 53 says Jesus was cut off out of the land of the living. All right, two goats, twin goats. One is offered up for, to the Lord, the other's a scapegoat. Listen to this, twins. Jesus is standing before Pilate. They said, it's our custom that once a year we let a prisoner go. So they bring a man, it's, I'm talking about a rogue man. And we call him Barabbas. His name is Bar, son of Abba. Here's twin goats. We have the son of Abba, and we have a son of Abba. Are you with me? Look at the integrity of this thing. And Jesus is standing there, and the son of Abba, Bar Abba, is standing there. They said, who do you want us to let go? And they said, give us Barabbas. Well, of course they need him. He can't die for my sins. He's needing the same redeeming power in the son of Abba standing next to him. So they, it keeps going on, keeps going on. They let him go. Listen, there's, there's the one let go unto the Lord. And Jesus becomes the scapegoat. Isn't it wonderful? Whew. Make you cry, man. Whew. So, 7.42. All right. Let's pull John 11.23. You getting anything? I want to read this one scripture and then I just want to say some thoughts to you that will just stir you. John 11.23 to 26. This is, this is the epitome of Easter right here. John 11.23 to 26. Jesus said to her, your brother, this is Lazarus, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. Hang on, hang on. In the beginning was the word, words with God, the word was God, in him was life and the life was the light, inward illumination, the candle of man. That's why Jesus said, I am the life, and that's why he said, I've come that you might have life. What do you mean? I'm gonna light your candle inwardly again. Amen. How's he gonna do that? By the born again experience through the spirit of life in Christ. Are you with me? Saints, we're born again. This is for real. This ain't religion. You have the witness on the inside of you. You are born again. There is a new creation in you. I don't care how bound you might be in an area, we're all working through something. But listen, it can get less and less and less and less every year until that which has always had you since you was a kid. I'm telling you, you can have life and it have no place in you. Where it doesn't haunt you. Where it don't just pull on your chain anytime it wants to and you obey it. I know that life, man. Anybody else know that life? Sure we do. There's freedom. This really happened. This, 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 this is for real. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. He, 
who believes in me. Boy, that's me right there. Though his body may die, he, there's the spirit of man, will live. And whoever lives and believes in me, look here, spiritual, will never ever be separated from God. Man. Boy. Some of these things are not fun to say, but I mean, sometimes you, just, sometimes you need to wash these stains out of some clothes. You know, it, it, you got to scrub on some things. I've had this question before because listen to me. I don't know about you, but I've practiced sin in my past. A couple others that have, uh, y'all pray for us. <laughs> Anybody in here besides me ever practiced sin? Just shoot your hand up, I won't look. Nobody but you and God and anybody. <laughs> I have, I practiced it. Knew I was sinning. But I loved me more than I loved God in that area. There ain't no other way to say it. Well, I hate that I do it. You don't hate it enough yet. That's not merciless. That's just raw. That's, I'm, I lived that life way, decades. God, I don't want to be like that. That is true. But you got to come to the place that you love God more than you love you. And you want to please God more than you want to please your body. Otherwise, I'm telling you what, you'll never, it'll just be a wish. But this is so huge to me. I've heard over the years, now you gotta work this out with God, okay? <laughs> I'm just trying to make you, I don't want any man-made stains in our clothes. But what if I die, I'm a believer, what if I die and I have sin in my life? Let me forewarn you something, you do. <laughs> you have a body. Yeah, but I'm not aware of any sin. You said it good, I'm not aware of. But this thing, listen, if that was even a potential, Jesus didn't need to come. Because this is your best, grandest Sunday. I'm talking you wake up praying in the Holy Ghost. You're in the glory all the way to the church. Your car levitates off the ground. You look like Star Wars hovering into the parking lot. Are you with me? Angels pick you up and they escort you in here. You sit down and Dust flies off of you. There's bumps under your shirt where there's wings actually starting to grow. Your best day. You stand up and a tongue and interpretation comes out of you. You lay hands and I mean the dead are raised. Your best day. I'm gonna say it raw because it's the way the Bible says it. It's bloody minstrel rags in front of God. On that day, much less the days you wake up with bad breath, you stank, you done shoot somebody's tail out that day, done harped on your spouse. If you just rolled your eyes at somebody, that's sinful. Because this is compared, the Torah was doing its best to show you the level of holiness that you must attain. J j listen, just barely unthankful for anything, sin. And let's not forget this, if you break one point of the law, you've broken all 116, 613 commandments. Lord, we need Jesus. I mean, I just, I shouldn't have said that like that to you. Okay, now I'm an adulterer. I'm a fornicator. I didn't commit adultery. No, you broke one, you've broken them all. <laughs> so my point is, we all have sin in our life. I'm not saying we all have active, hideous sin, but we all, we all have sin. Listen, let's not remember, sin is a nature. It's not, it's, deeds always are the expression of a nature within. A dog goes, because it's in him to do it. 
My dogs never went meow. Why? Not in him to do it. But a cat goes meow. Some of them go. <laughs> Why? It's nature. This thing here is waiting to be redeemed. This has been redeemed. This is being redeemed to the level that you are redeeming it actively. You can be redeemed here and think unredeemed and live so far below who you are. All right. Let's see. I like to poke myself in the eye before I... I said, here, let's look here. And they make this weird sound off a bald head. They go, all right, bald and bearded. (laughs) I asked Jody today, I said, bald and bearded. I said, I have my straw hat on. Man, hey, look here, right here. I got my clothes on, I come out there. Boy, look at that. You put that hat on like it's low, and I'm talking about come out that room like this. Hey, mom. I came out like this, and she just come around the corner. I said, what's up, mama? Like that. She said, I said. <laughs> I mean, I was like, how you doing, my, my chick? <laughs> I said, <laughs> I, I didn't look at her. I said, what's up? You'll take a ride in my car, baby. <laughs> but I looked at her, and I said, I said, am I still handsome to you, girl? She said, boy, she said, you are the epitome of gorgeous. I said, whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> that made me feel good. Now, what in the world got me on that? Bald and bearded. Bald and bearded, that's right. Okay. <laughs> Back to the resurrection. And that, my friends, is why we needed a savior. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm, forget all that. I'm just gonna get to some notes right here. <laughs> all of the redeemed shall live with him. The trumpet of the archangel is gonna wake the sleepers. They're gonna wake to put on their glorious body, transformed and made like Christ's glorious body. It's gonna be wrapped about them as the vesture of their perfected and emancipated spirits. Then our brothers and sisters will rise and all our dear ones who have fallen asleep in Jesus, the Lord is gonna bring with him because they are with him. Their body is in something called a cemetery. They are not there literally. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. This is the glorious hope of the church wherein we see, listen to me, the death of death. And the destruction of the grave. Death cannot kill a believer. It can only usher him into a freer form of life. Say it again. Death cannot kill a believer. It can only usher him into a freer form of life. Man, when the believer leaves his body, you know when Paul said, I have a a, a desire to depart, that Greek word, the root Greek word of depart is to set sail. Isn't that wonderful? It only, listen, the believer, when he leaves his body, gets a, in the spirit, he gets a major upgrade. I'm talking iPhone 1 to iPhone 15. Major upgrade. And then there's a day that our bodies get a, it's literally a total transformation. The word alasso, which means a total exchange. All right, because Jesus lives, we his people live. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Those who have departed have not perished. Those who have departed have not perished. We lay their precious body in the cemetery and we can set up a stone at the head, but we could engrave on them the Lord's words, she is not dead, (laughs) she sleepeth. Can you imagine a day that the righteous dead's bodies, not the unrighteous dead, that's not for a thousand years later, the graves open and the word repair is a Latin word. We get rap, 
rapture from it, which means to snatch out or catch out. And one of the best definitions means to snatch by the hair of the head to avoid imminent danger. Caught out. And graves opened everywhere. To meet the Lord in the air. See, that's resurrection. Jesus said, my reward is with me. Yes, he's been raised spirit and physically from the dead. We've been raised from the dead spiritually. There's a day, listen, your body's gonna experience a resurrection. Isn't it wonderful? There's a major difference between the decease of the godly and the death of the ungodly. Death comes to the ungodly man as a penal infliction. But to the righteous man, it's a summons to his father's palace. I believe that, don't you? Listen to this, just some more notes. To the sinner, it is an, death is an execution. It's eternal death after death. To the saint, it's an undressing. Death to the sinner is the king of terrors. Death to the saint is the end of terrors. To die in the Lord is a covenant blessing. Back to what I was saying. What if I die and I'm in sin? I'm not trying to make light of this, saints, at all. That, I don't, I don't, I don't want to die that way. But listen to me. That's huge, Miss Donna, isn't it? I know that. I know. It answers questions. Soothes. Balm Gilead. David said as a covenant man, if I make my bed in hell, you're there with me. Look, at, pull this one scripture. I think it's Job. Please pull this right. Job not in the NLT. Job nineteen twenty five to twenty seven. Read this with me. What if I die and I'm in sin? Well, one, I'd have to say this. The Bible says, if Christ has been raised from the dead. It says if Christ is, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not raised from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15. And if Christ is not raised from the dead, then our preaching is vain and you are still dead in your sins. Hold up. If Christ is not raised from the dead, then you are still dead in your sins. Talking to believers. If Christ is not raised out of the dead, then you believers are still in your sins. That means if Christ is raised from the dead, my faith is in him, even though I still got these issues I'm working through, I'm not dead in my sins. So can I die in my sins? <laughs> okay. It's big. I'm not making light of it. I'm just making bigger of faith in Jesus. That's all I'm trying to do. We're not careful. We'll somehow get, get, this, get the scale teeter-tottered where it's all back on us. You know, he did a little bit. Does, Connie. I mean, he did a little bit. We'll say, it is finished. Well, if it's finished, let it be finished. Do you know the word is tetelesta, and it means it is finished and it'll always be finished. On your worst day, it's still finished. And I'm thankful for that. That's encouraging to me. Let's, let's just let Jesus and God determine who's gonna be in heaven. Don't, don't. Wow. Okay. Job 19, read, read this out loud. 25, 26, 27, ready? But as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives and he will stand upon the earth at last. And after my body has decayed, yet in my body I will see God. I will see him for myself. Yes, I will see him with my own eyes. I am overwhelmed at the thought. <laughs> Come on, church, that's wonderful, isn't it? Say, I know my Redeemer lives. 
Ah, uh, that's enough for one setting. Woo. Huh? I'm going to do a repeat of a lot of it. I know my Redeemer lives. You ask me how I know he lives, the song said he lives in within my heart. He touched me and now I know something happened. You can't even explain it. Just something happened and now I know. He touched me and made me whole. Man, I encourage you. Ain't none of us 100% whole in our thinking. We're in process. There's a lot of us that need wholeness in our body. The saints, you are complete and whole in your spirit. You start just keep learning how to live from the inside out. That's the key, is learning to live from the inside out. Let this be the umpire that calls ball or strike and go with it. Don't reason yourself out of it. Go with it. Father, thank you for this wonderful opportunity to eat the bread of life together tonight. I bless these people best I know how in faith in Jesus' name. Father, I ask you to give them the spirit of wisdom, revelation, speak to them, lead them, guide them, show them things to come, and most of all, remind them of things you've taught them that they know to be true, deep-seated and rooted down on the inside of their heart and their conscience. Thank you for every person here tonight, their children, every person on this, all over this campus. It's good to be here together. And we worship you. Would you say this with me? I believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. I believe this. I have the witness of the Spirit of God in my spirit. I am a child of God. On my best day and on my worst days, I'm a child of God. I'm forever his. He'll never leave me or forsake me or turn his heart away from me. And by grace, through faith, I hold on to him eternally. Amen. Man, church. Mm. I could sit at the altar and cry and think for a while after that. God bless you. Be safe in the parking lot. Watch for kids, please.